episode of MJ's Progress Not Perfection. Today we have Kelly. Kelly was an addict for 38 years. Um, and he's an incredible journey to where he is now. Um, lots of gangs, you know, lots of drugs, lots of, you know, fights, lots of craziness. Started out in punk rock and, you know, yeah, I mean, I can't even say. We're going to get into it. I'll let him get right into it. Welcome to the show, though. I appreciate you know, taking the time to just come on here and talk with me. Yeah. Um, Kelly's your name, correct? Yeah. Kelly, goodbye, Kelly. Okay. And it, I think I read that you were in addiction for 38 years? Yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah, um, yeah I'm 52. <laughs> uh, you're 52. Okay. I was going to say, where did we start? Uh, 14, you started, it sounds like. Um, yeah. Now, um, were you into at 14? Was it just like small stuff, like, you know, drinking here and there? Or like, did you just jump right in head, head first? Well, um, my parents divorced when I was really, really young. And uh, my dad was kind of like, he was kind of like a bachelor, you know, he worked as a DJ at clubs. And back when I was younger, um, in California, Orange County, they had um, like, what was called all adult apartment complexes. It's not like what all adult means today, <laughs> <You know? laughs> but it was just basically no kids were allowed. And before the discrimination laws came into effect in the late seventies, that went away. But I lived with my dad when he was a bachelor and my dad um, smoked a lot of weed. He did other things, but he kept it away from me, but he was pretty, you know, he, he had the weed around me, quite a bit and he was always dating women that were about half his age so there was always a party going on in that apartment and um the first time that I ever really got into alcohol um was uh was he had a a, a small birthday party for one of his girlfriends and left a bottle of champagne um laying out they only drank like a, a you know a little bit each and then they went into his room and they were smoking or whatever and I jumped into that bottle and um, I finished the whole thing. I think I was about maybe eight years old or nine years old or something like that. Uh -huh. um, and uh, and I got sick as hell. But that was my very first experience with alcohol. And then several years later, I picked it up again. Yeah. Now, in, in that time period of the 38 years, when, and I don't mind jumping around. Um, in the 38 years, was it like, did you have a main drug of choice in that 38 years? Anything that would get me high. But both of my parents, even though they were divorced, they, they all smoked a lot of weed. There was always about a quarter pound in, in my mom's house at any given time. I, I eventually, you know, went back from my dad's house to my mom's house. I only lived with my dad for a couple of years. That was just the first experience that I'd ever seen. Any mm -hmm. type of alcohol or party or anything like that was there. But when I went to my mom's house, um, there was always drinking there was always a lot of weed around and uh and and i would begin you know kind of stealing it i guess it really started for me um i was a punk rocker in the 80s and that was back when punk rockers were socially unacceptable we were pests you know yeah. to society yeah. we weren't we weren't the cute little pets they are today you know <laughs> we, we were a threat you know Especially and, down uh, there in Southern California in the eighties. I mean, were you ever playing around the Viper room and shit? Because like I got I got sober in LA. Mm -hmm. So I um, you know I've seen a little bit things. before that time. Uh, we were more Fender's Ballroom, Olympic Auditorium, Perkins Palace. Um, okay. All the trendy girls used to go dance at Circuit Circle City in in the city of Orange, and uh, and I grew up in Anaheim Hills, which was kind of the pinnacle of orange county you know it was kind of like the 90210 i guess of orange <laughs> county so i went to uh canyon high school and that's that's where things really kind of started turning upside down for me just prior to my going to high school um i was in i was living with my mom and i was going to uh, junior high which was a um year-round school and the very last day of school when i was graduating from ninth grade to go into 10th grade which would have been high school because over where I grew up, junior high was seventh through ninth grade. Mm -hmm. You graduate ninth grade like a regular graduation from middle school. Then you go 10th, 11th, and 12th, which was high school. And on the very last day, um, <laughs> or the day before the very last day of junior high, I jumped out of the bus school window just to be a show off. And the next morning, um, I got suspended 
expelled from school. I mean, who who does that? You know, they expel you on the very last day <laughs> when you're supposed to graduate. So I I grew up in a relatively abusive household. You know, my 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 mom had a hard time, and I, I'm not gonna say too much about that because my mom is my best friend. You know what I mean? Yeah. She threw a lot of crap when she was younger. You know, so she was just doing the best she could with kids. But I was no day at the park. I was the only boy. Yeah. You know, so um, anyway, I uh, I jumped out of the school window. My stepdad was coming home. He was going to kick my ass, boy. And my sister scrambled to get me out of there. So I went and lived with my dad for the next year. Um, and uh, and when I lived with my dad, that's where I really went into into the whole punk rock mode. And I, I take that back. That was actually seventh grade that that happened because I lived with my dad in my eighth grade year. I okay. came back to my mom's house in my ninth grade year. Yeah, I know how kids oh, jump. I see the guitar behind you. You still play, I guess? I've been in bands most of my life. Um, part of part of my story is, uh, I don't know if, if you know who Mike Ness is from Social Distortion, but I knew him when he was, uh, back when he was an addict. When I was in high school, his girlfriend was this girl that I used to hang out with and go to high school with. And, um, and I got, uh, I, I got tied up with them and, that's a big, big part of my addiction right there in the beginning. And what was that in the beginning that you got into? Well, um, I used to have to sneak out of my house. You know, I, I'd have to lie all the time because I had really strict parents, you know. Um, so anything that I did, I had a lie. And so I was developing a, a real addictive personality before I ever really got into the substances. But when I came back to my mom's house, um, in ninth grade, I went through school there, and then I, I moved into 10th grade, and 10th grade is where I met my friend who was dating Mike Ness at the time, and in 1984, November 14th in 1984, there was a show at the Olympic Auditorium that was uh, Public Image, Social Distortion, and a couple other bands, and I went to that show with my friend and with Mike Ness, um, and uh, of course, they went backstage, and I was out enjoying the show. I was scared, man, you know, because I was I was 15. It was the week before I turned 16 because my birthday is November 27th. This was November 14th. So I was just about to turn 16. And this was probably the pinnacle of my uh, of my turning uh, turning punk rock, so to speak. Yeah. Um, and so I was at this show just having a blast, but I was really kind of scared because there was a lot of older people around me, you know. I don't know if you've ever been to the Olympic Auditorium, but it holds thousands. And uh, and so what happened was uh, I saw the show, had a really good time at the show. I was pretty much by myself. I saw some of my friends that I knew, but I hung by myself. And uh, at the end of the show, I was going to go meet uh, Jackie and Mike back at the car, and we were going to go back to Orange County. Um, when I came outside, there was like a line of people all along the whole outside of the Olympic auditorium. They had tickets, but the fire marshal wouldn't let them in. Um, they didn't like punk rockers back then. So the cops called the fire marshal and told them to shut it down. There was too many people in there doing crazy shit. So they didn't let these people in. So the show happened. We go outside and you have all these like a thousand angry punk rockers that had tickets and they wouldn't let them in. So when I'm walking out, I just, you could feel the vibe, man. You could feel the tension. I'm really young, so I'm getting kind of scared. You know, I don't know what's about to happen. Um, across the street from all these punk rockers, there was just lines of cop cars. And right when I walked out, I took maybe five steps um, down the block because we were, we were parked a good, you know, probably half a mile away from the electric auditorium. And I saw the first bottle fly. And I was like, whoa, you know, it tripped me out. And then just a barrage of bottles just started flying at these cops. And this whole line of punk rockers, just hundreds of them, ran across the street. And I'm standing here for about three minutes watching them. And they tilt this cop car over. And then somebody starts a fire with a jacket and throws this flame, flaming jacket on top of this car. And it was a riot. So cops started spreading all over the place um paddy wagons came out of nowhere like they were prepared for this so i ran and i ran down the west side of the building and i turned to go uh um let me see i turned to go like sat down on the south side of the building towards where the car was and i passed it back to the olympic auditorium and there was this alley and by this time people were scattered everywhere there was literally hundreds of people in the street 
just running and rioting and breaking shit. And um, I looked down the alley and I saw a silhouette of two people running. It was two girls and they were running and the silhouette got bright because this cop car came up behind them in the alley with the light shining on him. And he sped up and he ran him over and then he backed up and ran him over again and then skid back out in the street. And then I realized this is a serious freaking situation that's going on. Um, so I started running. I ran to where the car was and I, it seemed like I was running forever. And I put my hands on the car and I'm trying to catch my breath. And I hear this voice behind me say, get down on the fucking ground, get, get on your face, get on your face, get on the ground. And I didn't know they were talking to me, but I turned around and it was this cop that was talking to me. And right when I turned around, he hit me in the head um, with a club and, uh, and um, everything just kind of went black. I hit the ground and he was beating on me and then he was joined by probably a half a dozen uh, Foothill Division LAPD officers that were beating on me. Um, and I was on my back and I'm trying to deflect, you know, blows from these clubs that were just coming from every direction. They actually reached down and turned me over and started beating on me from my back. Um, and then uh, what seemed like forever, I remember one of them, this female officer said, let's kill this one and move on. And I, I remember looking at him going, you're going to freaking kill me right now? You know, so I was tripped out. Um, they cuffed my hands to my feet with plastic cuffs and they picked me up like a suitcase, two cops on both sides. And I looked up and that female officer, she kicked me in the forehead and everything went real, real black, you know, because I'd already been hit in the forehead with a club. I was pretty clubbed up. I was, I was pretty, pretty screwed up. They threw me in the back of this paddy wagon and they took me to LA County. Um, and, uh, and they called my parents, and, and that's where shit really got kind of crazy. Um, you know, my parents came to get me. They were unhappy about it. Um, I came out, you know, um, from custody. They, they had me in the room, um, you know, signing for stuff that belonged to me, and my stepdad turned around, and he punched me. And my face was already messed up, but he punched me pretty hard. Yeah. So when we went home, um, you know, my stepdad was really kind of pissed at me, and, and he... He wanted me to go out and do some yard work or some shit like that. It's like, <laughs> it's like six o'clock in the morning, you know? And, uh, and I'm sitting there with a shovel doing, I forget what he had me doing, digging some kind of freaking trench in the front yard or something. I threw the shovel down and the clothes that I had on that were all bloody. I said, fuck this. And I started walking and I ran away from home. And, uh, and of course I had to go through, you know, court and all that stuff. And, um, so I was going back and forth between home, but I told my mom, I'm not coming, I'm not coming back. Um, by this time, uh, I, I was already into drinking pretty heavily. Um, I was pretty drunk at the public image show, but for me, um, the reason that I really started drinking was because I had developed a real screwed up personality. All of my instincts were real off balance. Um, I had pride because I was, you know, so sick of, you know, getting abused and getting put down all the time that everybody else outside of my family, I demanded that they showed me respect. And I wasn't a real, you know, good fighter back then. That, that came later. I was just a tough kid. You know, it was hard to beat me up. Um, so Thank I was you. real prideful um, because my, uh, my self-esteem was stepped on so much. Uh, my ego grew out of that as well um so when i finally started trying alcohol i finally found something that agreed with the way that i felt inside <laughs> you know yeah. and all of a sudden i was able to say the things that i only thought which was fuck this fuck that fuck you you're cool i'm out you know what I mean? so <laughs> yep. all of a yep. sudden i was you know found something that allowed me to be free to say what i really wanted to say where in my sober mind my inhibitions would stop me you know, from doing these things. And I didn't like having inhibitions. Yeah. So, um, anyway, when I ran away, uh, I, I, uh, had to go through court. Um, they put me away for 30 days. They, they charged me with assault with a deadly weapon on a police officer. Um, they dropped deadly, the what two, deadly weapon. Did you have, I didn't have anything. They, he thought. lied. Yeah. Oh, okay. Cause they got bottles thrown down by other people. So they just said everybody was hurting them. Is basically well, pretty much. It was, it was a riot. I mean, I, I, 
I mean, it's like, the eighties. It's a lot easier to lie in the eighties. There's no body cameras. There's, you know, and you know, the cops are the pinnacle in the eighties and they're not doing it. Cause this is even before Rodney King, you know, so they really oh, yeah. get, were getting away with shit back in the eighties and their word was the holiest of words, you know, cause it wasn't until like really that in like what 92 or 91 when that happened that people were like, wait, cops do that. Like, yeah. you know, people that never had it happen to them, I should say, you know, they were like, wait, that's, cops do that kind of thing you know oh yeah and now yeah. obviously with body cameras and phones you know it's really we know is out there you know and people are starting to talk more and obviously tell more stories i just had an ex-cop on the other day um and even he was you know he dealt with police brutality as an ex-cop where they handcuffed him wrong on purpose and he got arrested in the you know police station and just that's not a far ride from the police station to the jail you know and by the time they got to the jail, his hands were completely purple and he has permanent damage in his hand because they didn't put the safety lock on just so they could teach him a lesson. Yeah. So, you know, it, it's, it's, it's still going on. We know that, but obviously it's been happening for as long as, as long as anybody can remember, you know? So, yeah. you know, but yeah. Okay. So well, now you're, uh, from the, now you have a chip on your shoulder. Well, yeah, it, it affected my life quite a bit because the cop, it affected me so bad that I remember who it was to this day on 52. His name was uh, Officer Thomas Wunsch, badge number 9447, Foothill Division. And uh, he went into, he was the one that told me to, you know, stop, get down on the ground. And then when I turned around, hit me in the head and started the assault. Um, and uh, he went into court and he said, no, he threw a beer bottle at me and he hit me with a beer bottle and he told me he was going to kill me. And I was sitting there shaking my head going, dude. I can't believe that the judge believes this shit. I'm 16 years old, dude. I'm probably 80 pounds wet and wearing boots. And you think with no, with no priors, believe right? that I was going to kill you? Yeah, with no priors, right? You didn't have any priors. No, huh? Yeah, no, I've exactly. never been in trouble. First time getting in trouble, and all of a sudden you're going to kill yeah. a cop? Come on, man. Yeah. So okay. the, the public attorney, the public defender I had, he told me right in front of my mom, he said, you're going to plead guilty. We're going to make a deal because I don't have time to deal with this. Uh, you're going to do 30 days in juvenile hall. You're going to have six years over your head. Um, if you get in trouble at any time, you're going to go to jail for that six years. And he goes, and I'll tell you something else. He says right in front of my mom. He said, if I hear that you go to juvenile hall and you tell a counselor that I made you take this deal against your own will, I will take you back to court and I will see you do seven years as an adult in the penitentiary. So basically I was blackmailed to say I did something that I didn't do. So I went to juvenile hall for 30 days. When I got out, I ran away from home again um, and uh, went out living on the street. And and that's when I got uh, my first tattoo. My first tattoo artist was this dude who just got out of prison. I'm not going to say his name, but he just got out of prison. Really cool cat. But he was the one that introduced me to, uh, to drugs. I was 16 years old. And the very first time that I ever did any drugs, it was crank. And, uh, and and I shot it up. He did it for me. And uh, right, right, you went, you went, zero, you went zero to a hundred, bud. You went like, oh, yeah. like oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Drink, I drink. Oh yeah, just give me, give it to me, but shoot it. Yeah. <laughs> and I was the coolest kid in Anaheim Hills. You know what I mean? Because I, I moved from Anaheim Hills down to Orange, which was literally just down the hill. Mm-hmm. So everybody that I went to high school with, you know, I I had kind of a weird reputation because I was I was a geek growing up in school. I just didn't fit in. I was I was a dork. You know, um, and, uh, you know, when I was really younger, I, I don't know if you remember this time, but when I was really younger, my parents used to make me wear tough skins in, in elementary school, you know, where at that time it was all OPs, you know, and, and you know, eyes on shirts and shit like mm-hmm. that. So I just didn't fit in. And, and I was always picked on when I was younger. Um, then all of a sudden, you know, uh, I'm living down in Orange and I could hear people talk about, hey, you're Kelly Pierce, man, he turned to punk rock because my last name is English. I had legally changed because I, I didn't like my dad's name anymore. Yeah. But my did. given name is Kelly Pierce. And they said, yeah, man, did you hear Kelly Pierce? He turned punk rock. Yeah, I heard he shot a cop, dude. <laughs> Just like all these stories going on about me. I'm like, I can really know. I'm living down in the city of Orange in a tiny little apartment with a buddy of mine, and I'm addicted to crank. <laughs> So, uh, at 16 years old, I, I met my first tattoo artist. Um, he asked me if I wanted to do some crank. 
I told him I didn't know anything about it. He said, well, you can snort it, but I shoot it. So I shared a needle with him multiple times. I'm, I'm one of those guys who got really lucky that I didn't catch something from that. But Especially in the for, 80s, too. Yeah. So for the next year, and I was still on probation. You know, I still had that time hanging over my head. So for the next year, I uh, sold crank and shot up just as much as I possibly could. Not going to school, no. right? No, huh? I quit yeah. school. Yeah, that's what I figured. And I had a girlfriend, and I got her into drugs. We did a lot of acid, a lot of mushrooms, um, and uh, and and I was just uh, real, uh, um, not. I don't I don't want to say that I was uh, a tough guy yet because I wasn't. I was just that person that thought I'm going to do whatever the hell I want to do because, well, because fuck you. That's why. Yeah, you, you already know? had to deal with all the rules. You already had to deal with all the bullshit. Now, like you, like they said, you turned punk rock. So yeah. now, now it's like you're 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 your own boss. No one's driving the bus but you now. Yeah. And uh, uh, during that year, I started playing guitar, got into bands, and uh, it just uh, it went on from there. I stayed addicted to um, drugs. My main drug of choice that I found later on in that year before I went back to juvenile hall. Um, they, uh, I, I turned myself in because I had all that time hanging over my head. So I ended up doing another nine months in juvenile hall. And then I got released um, with uh, basically wiped my record clean. They, they expunged it because I went into the army for a short time. Uh, after I got out, turned 18. Um, then I came out. I was in the National Guard. And Are you sober? I, no. Hell no. Oh. <laughs> I was drinking all the time. I was even smoking weed when I was in the army. You know, I was supposed to do that. Yeah. Um, but no, I, I never considered even getting sober until I was about 21, I think was the first time that I tried. And, uh, I was in a band, I was living with the girlfriend. Um, I started training, uh, martial arts. I'm a mixed martial artist. I've been doing for about 30 years. And, uh, and I started training martial arts and just all of a sudden overnight, I became a super scientific, really good fighter. Um, by that time I was in a gang. Um, we started out as a small little, you know, bunch of little skinheads, street thugs. Today, it's one of the most predominant uh, gangs in the prison systems, um, very high profile. And uh, and I was one of the original members of that. Me and uh, five of my buddies started that. Uh, okay. you know, a couple and, of them are, a couple of them are still involved, you know. Yeah, but at least you, at least a bunch of recovery, because um, I see that. Well, all I used them, to see all the originals. Oh, oh, that's awesome. Because um, I, I used to see all the time at NA meetings. I'm not sure if you go to AA or NA or any of them. Oh, yeah, I go to AA. Um, but I used to see at NA meetings all the time. I used to go to Santa Monica. Like, I got sober on the west side. And mm -hmm. um, so I was over at Santa Monica all the time. And Culver City is where I stayed. And But there was always, like, this uh, was this Angels in Recovery or something in Recovery. or There were, always, like, this big biker gang. They always showed up. But it's something in Recovery. And it's like their gang now, and they all show up together, and they always you see them pull up to the meetings, like at Jocelyn Park, and there's just a bunch of bikes that pull in and shit like that. And yeah. my friend did a bunch of graffiti for. Him. But yeah. AA, AA is great in Southern California. Uh, it's yeah, it is. And 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 like I said, all all the originals, you know, that I grew up with, um, the ones that are still alive, they're they're all in the program in one way or another. And you know, I mean the the gang is what it is you know it's it's yeah. big it's, it's large organization and and you know um i mean you know guys do what they do you know that's that's uh you know, it's just kind of part of everything but yeah. um but the uh, reason i say that is because uh you know one of my best friends who who is you know pretty much uh you know one of the main guys um he's the one who ultimately helped me get sober so i'm gonna fast forward just a little bit through my life, you know, I was involved in that. I was involved in bands for most of my life. Uh, I moved to Las Vegas. There was a time um, in Orange County that I was working in strip clubs, and I was actually the only one still alive and out of prison from all of my homeboys. And, and once my homeboys went to prison, it became more of a prison gang than a street gang. And that's kind of where it started to evolve at that point, and that was in the early 90s. Um, so I, I tried to, I was really a loner. I tried to stay by myself. So I started training jujitsu um, and, uh, and mixed martial arts. And uh, in 1993, 
1992 or 93, I was training a, a guy for UFC number two. And he was about 280 pounds. His name is Todd Medina. Great guy. He still owns a gym out in Orange County. He's, he's, he's a big influence to the whole MMA you know, world from, from the vintage days. And, and he, like I said, he still trains fighters. I feel like I heard Brennan Schaub talk about him before. Maybe, yeah. Brennan but Schaub he's a great a, guy. He's a comedian that, you know, he used to be a UFC fighter, Brennan Schaub, and now he's a comedian. And mm-hmm. I, he has a podcast. I'm pretty sure he's talked. I've heard that name, Tommy Medina. So that's got to be worth Yeah, it. Uh, he, was, he was called El Tibron, which means the shark in Spanish. And uh, I think Spanish. But um, anyway, I was training him for UFC number two. And uh, make a long story short, his 288 pounds to my 160 pounds, um, I had him in my guard where I was on my back. I had my legs around his hips, so I was controlling his hips and my own hips and he stood up while I was on my back. He did the right thing, went to escape and put all of his weight down on me and he made my right ear touch my right shoulder blade. It broke my neck. Um, and I didn't have insurance or anything back then. Yeah. You know, so I just kind of, I, yeah, it, it, it just <laughs> walked it off. <laughs> it, it broke, you know, uh, the next day my head was sitting like this, you know, my head was literally over on the left side of my body. It was weird. Yeah. Um, Bit. But I, I kind of let it heal that way because I didn't have insurance. So I was dealing with a lot of pain. And then I fast forward and I got um, I got married to some chick, I don't know, uh, that I didn't really like. But I ended up having kids with her that I love a lot. <laughs> and uh, we had moved to Las Vegas because I was uh, working in, in uh, glazing. I'm a contractor. So I had my own company and that company took me out to Las Vegas during the building boom in 2003. And... Being in the union out in Las Vegas, I finally had things that I never had before. I bought a house. I was making about 120 grand a year. Um, you know, I had a wife. I had three beautiful children, um, and and I had this drug addiction that was about to get much worse. Um, see, when I came out here, I was in a whole lot of pain. I was smoking a whole lot of weed, drinking a whole lot. I do cocaine here and there, but when I came out to Las Vegas, okay. As stupid as this makes me sound, I did not know what painkillers were. I had already been a heroin addict from the time I was 16 until, you know, and I still was. You know, I just wasn't doing it as much. I'd do it when I get my hands on it. But yeah. um, I was trying to stay away from things pretty much, but I wasn't doing a good job at it. But when I came out here to Vegas, my wife at the time, because I was in so much pain working all these hours in the high rises, she said, why don't you use your insurance Go to the doctor? And I thought, insurance, you know? I didn't even know what that was. I'm, I'm going to try it. So I made a, an appointment, went to go see a doctor, and uh, and he took an MRI on my neck, called me back a couple weeks later, and he said, hey, your neck is broken. I said, yeah, I know. He said, okay, well, your third clavicle or whatever it was, he said it, it broke completely in half. He said it healed like that, and you're supposed to have like a four-degree rake where your neck sits back, your neck goes back like an S-shape. Your, yeah. your your body should, your your spine should be shaped like an S, kind of like, you know? Um, from your neck, it goes back like that, and then your spine, and your head's supposed to sit back like that, you know? Mine sits forward two and a half degrees to the left. And, uh, and that's because it was broken. There was, you know, um, arthritis growing around it because it had been like that for several years now. So he said, there's two ways to fix it. And so I said, okay, I'm all ears. You know what's up? I'm, I'm singing in a punk rock band at that time called Slaves of the Sun King. We're having a really good time in, in, uh, in Vegas. And it was like my 10th band. Um, and he said, well, we can do a surgery through the front of your throat. And I said, nah, no, no, <laughs> already that doesn't sound good. Yeah. You know, he said, yeah, it'll cut your voice box. It'll change things for you. I said, no, fuck that. I'm not doing that. Do you sing or do you play? I, I play lead guitar and I sing, I write, okay. and that's how actually my my all my homeboys from from the gang um, started calling me English. That that was one reason why. Because you were writing. Because I'm a lyricologist. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, yeah. sorry, that makes sense. Okay, so anyway, you say yeah, no voice box, can't do that. Go on. Yeah. So he said, well, if you don't want to do that, then you're going to have to take painkillers. So in my head, I'm thinking like, okay, was that like? Tylenol, codeine, or, or what? He said, no, you're going to need something stronger. I did not know what pain pills were. I, I really didn't. I, I didn't know the gravity of that situation, how, how dangerous they were. No one so knew he, that. So he said, um, this kind of doctor I had, he said, well, 
um, you know, do you have any tolerance to opiates? And I said, well, I'm a heroin addict. So I ratted myself out right there. I said, I'm a heroin addict. And, and, you know, in the height of my usage, you know, I, I, I could slam a quarter gram in a day. And, uh, and he said, okay, that's a pretty big tolerance. He goes, let's go ahead and start you off on oxycodone. What kind of milligram do you want? And I'm, you're talking Greek to me, dude. I don't, I don't know what you're talking about. So his answer was this. He said, well, I'm not taking it, so I don't care. What do you want? And I said, I, I guess give me something strong. So he said, okay, we'll start you off on oxycodone, 15 milligrams. And I had no idea what these were. I'm just like, all right, whatever. So he gives me a prescription. I leave there. It was the about green monsters. No, the, uh, yeah. Well, these ones were when they were yellow. Oh, the, the that's right. It was 2003, right? Yeah, the yellow 15s, uh, right before they had turned green. And so I went to go get the prescription filled. Um, the pharmacist was warning me about them. She said, look, these are addictive. I'm like, yeah, 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 whatever. So I went out to my truck, and my house was only about 15, maybe 10 minutes, 10 or 12 minutes from the Walgreens where I picked them up at. And um, I uh, <laughs> I got into my truck, and I looked at my watch, and it said take one for pain every four hours, or one every four hours you need for pain or whatever. I look at my watch. It's like 345. I'm like, mm, I'll take three. So I took them out, and I took three. And I sat there for about 20 minutes, you know, just I, I wanted to see if if this was going to affect me or anything because I really didn't know anything about it. So I'm like, OK, is this going to do something to my brain or something? Should I sit here? After about 20 minutes, nothing happened. I'm like, I'm just going to go home. So this is this is OK. Maybe the pain will go away, you know. So I start my truck and I start driving that 12 minute ride seemed like an hour. <laughs> and when I got home. I pulled up in my driveway, I opened up the door, and I threw up all over my driveway. <laughs> and I got out and went, this is great. <laughs> you know? And my wife and I, thing? we didn't have, my wife and I did not have a good relationship because I just didn't like her. And, yeah. uh, and I went in my house, and I found out really quick that when you first take oxycodone, you become real emotional. Your inhibitions are blown completely away and you start saying shit you would never say. And my wife comes downstairs, she goes, how was your appointment? I said, it was fucking great, Dave. Fucking like, you look beautiful, man. You know, like shit that I would never say. <laughs> See, we're, you're such an addict that usually like, you know, the, the, the thing is when someone's like, well, I don't know what it is. So just take half and just see how yeah. it feels. And you're like, fuck it. I'm taking three. <laughs> well, it's said, you know, take one for pee every four hours. I'm kind of like, well, I'm three quarters of the way through the day, so I should probably take three, you know? I'm going to catch um, up. <laughs> I'm lucky that, that I didn't die because uh, today, you know, they lace that stuff with fentanyl and you can take one and it'll kill you. And I found that out many, many years later because um, I, I had a very, uh, about almost three years ago now, I had a, a near-death experience on the street in Ensenada, Mexico, and I, I took one lace with fat and all. Um, that also killed my best friend in Ohio. But this started um, an addiction that lasted me for six years before I started looking for help for the first time. So I stayed addicted to them for six years. And by the time I went to uh, go to rehab for the very first time, um, I was crushing and snorting the tune of 800 to 1,000 milligrams a day. Um, and I was also taking Xanax, um, I do a little bit of coke here and there to wake up, you know, uh, um, but I was a functioning addict. And uh, I remember, you know, still to this day, I'm back in Las Vegas now. I just came back a year ago. And uh, people that I meet in the union that have known me for years are, are still telling me stories. And you remember when he did this? Remember when he threw the mallet at that guy on the roof building over at the Panorama Tower? And I'm like, nope. <laughs> <laughs> how long how long how, how much clean time do you have now now i i had a year uh in may so uh, yeah thank you thank you um that's the most time I, you've ever put together yeah that's that's the longest i ever stayed sober i've had spurts where i've been sober here and there i went to bible college in my late 20s um in orange county and uh and i stayed semi-sober for about you know three years but i would still drink here and there i'd still smoke a little weed here and there 
Um, so I've never had this type of sobriety time, but what makes it different is the program that I'm in the 12 step program taught me why I was an addict for 38 years. I tried multiple times, JD, multiple times to get sober. And the only thing that stayed real consistent was me. I always did it my way unbeknownst at the time that my way is what made me a fucking addict in the first place. So yeah. I was just beating a dead horse. Yeah. That's the problem is people, you know, when you're even still in addiction, like if you're listening to this and you're still in addiction, Hey, just so you know, your problem isn't drugs. Your problem isn't the drugs that you're doing right now. Your problem is up here and your solution to that problem is the drugs that you're doing. People will tell you that your problem is your drugs. Your problem is that how much you do. No, our problems are what cause us to use drugs as solutions. That's and you right. Don't, you don't know that until you go to rehab, until you start going to AA or meetings or some kind of support. I don't care if you go to therapy. I don't care if it's peer support, counseling. Talk to somebody and find out why you did what you did for so long or else you're going to do it again. Let's be real. Oh, yeah. You know, and... That's why I was telling you when I was younger, I had developed an addictive personality far before I ever picked up the drugs. And that's absolutely right. I'm glad that you said that because what I learned, um, you know, when I work with other people, it's not going to do any good to tell somebody you're an addict. You tell me that when I'm an addict, I'm going to say, I already fucking know that, dude. You know, why don't you tell me why I'm an addict? And that never even dawned on me until I got into the program. I'm an addict because I couldn't stop tripping over myself. I couldn't stop tripping over my own feelings. I couldn't get over myself. In fact, I have nicknamed the program. <laughs> I've coined my own phrase for the program. I call it the art of getting over yourself because that's exactly what you have to do yeah. is be able to be honest with yourself. It's like, like in the big book um, and how it works in the first two paragraphs, it says three times it requires rigorous self honesty. You've got to be honest with yourself. You know, what am I being honest about? Am I being honest that I'm an addict? Well, that, but you're also being honest with the fact that you have some serious character defects, which cause us to be an addict. And it kind of bounces off of what you said, JD. Uh, the drugs and the alcohol that I took, all the pills, all the heroin, all the alcohol was not the problem. That was a side effect of the problem. Yep. The problem was me. Yeah. And, and, uh, and that's do you guys read, do you guys read um, that portion of chapter five at every meeting in Las Vegas? Um, how it works? Yeah. Or, uh, yeah. yeah okay, we, yeah, we so that's a tradition. With that, or we start out with more about alcoholism. When uh, <clears throat> when I was in uh, Las Vegas in the early 2000s, I, uh, you know, being, being a gangster um, by nature, um, I joined uh, the motorcycle club, got into the motorcycle club community. And then, uh, <clears throat> you know, my, my uh, ex-wife and I, we got a divorce. I got married again, and... For the first year of my marriage with my new wife wasn't really working out, so I had moved back to San Diego in about 2013. 2015, I started getting involved in the motorcycle clubs out there and joined another motorcycle club out there. Um, one of my homeboys that uh, had done about 18 years in prison got released in 2015, and he, him and I were two of the originals from, from the gang. Um, when he got released, I was one of the only ones that could really go see him because it wasn't on paper. Um, so when I went to go see him, went to go visit him, it was really good to see him. When I was in Bible college, I had written him uh, probably about a 10-page letter. And he kept that letter. And we talked about it when I went to go see him. When I went to go see him, I'm, you know, neck deep in the clubs. I'm using, you know, uh, I'm using pain pills. I'm drinking. I'm kind of using whatever I could put my hands on. And uh, I went to go visit him, and in my head, I'm thinking, okay, so, uh, are, are, you know, are, are we back, you know, or is, is everything being, you know, rejuvenated, taking what we got from the inside, you know, that y'all did and bringing it back to the outside, or, you know, are we alive again? Who are we going to run up on? What's the drill, homie? And that's what I was expecting to hear from him. When I got to see him, he said, um, he said, no, bro, he goes, uh, we're not a gang no more, brother, we're a family now. He said, what we want to do is we want our family members to learn about sobriety, learn how to stay out of trouble, learn how to not be criminals, and learn how to live productive lives. And I'm kind of like, <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's not quite what I was expecting, but, you know, I want to hear about it. And he told me about his situation. You know, he spent 13 years in solitary confinement. 
And I was like, you know, listening to him. And he said, you know what, being in solitary confinement for 13 years is the best thing that ever happened to me because I learned about me, why I was an addict. He goes, it caused me to get closer to my God. So um, shortly thereafter, I left the club that I was with in Orange County and I started a new motorcycle club. And we're called the Forbidden Saints Motorcycle Club. And we were an addiction recovery support club because he was running um, detox units and support units um, out of his own pocket. And, you know, um, basically trying to come up with money to keep those alive. So I started the club to try to help him with that. And we started helping him a little bit. I'm in San Diego. He's in Orange County. I'm bringing people to him all the time from the MC community, from the gang life in San Diego that want to change their lives. So I'm helping people get sober. But the meantime, what I'm hiding from him and all the rest of my homies is that I am the biggest addict in this addiction recovery support club. And after a while, we we're not an addiction recovery support club anymore. We were actually just nothing less than a bunch of outlaws, just doing outlaw shit. And it kind of defeated the purpose. Um, and uh, I uh, came to a point to where I wanted to stop doing it because by now I'm doing a whole lot of crystal meth, which I hadn't done since I was a kid. But being in the club, I'm doing a whole lot of crystal meth, a whole lot of pills, and I am thoroughly blown completely out of my mind. Um, busting crimes left and right, hurting people. And, uh, and this was only, you know, several years ago. Um, so I called him at one point, I texted him at one point. And I said, Hey, I've got a guy that needs to get into the program this whole time. JD, he kept telling me, Kelly, when are you going to get over yourself? When are you going to get in the program? I hate when he said that. I'm like, what do you mean get over myself? Bro? What the, you know, what the fuck does that mean? You know, it's like, you get in the program, you'll understand, but you need to get over yourself, bro. Cause you, know, you, you got some serious drinking problem. Um, what he was really trying to say was that was a nice way of him saying you're a fucking messed up drug addict, bro. You know, and I know it. You think I don't, but I do. You know, you think that uh, everybody does not know that you're messed out of your head, that you're on pills and that you're a gangster and a freaking biker that's just busting crimes. And you think nobody knows that. And that's that was what he was probably thinking, <laughs> you know. Yeah, because he, he knew he, what he, he going to say to you, really, though, like. You know, he has to say it that way or else you're going to be defensive anyway. Yeah. So I texted him at one point. I said, look, I got this guy. He needs to get into the program. Um, he's got a pill problem, meth problem. And he texted me back right away. And he says, does he want to do something about the problem? And I said, yes. Yes, I do. It's me, brother. And he texted me back and he just said, ah, A-H-H-H. In other words, you finally told me. Um. He, he is involved in a very high profile um, prison organization um, now. And uh, he's been involved in that for a long time. It's kind of like one of those things, once you, you're in, you know, you don't just leave it, one of those things. Um, and there was uh, some type of a RICO act going on um, with that organization. And, um, and when, uh, when he texted me, about seven minutes after he texted me, uh, he got taken down by uh, FBI and, um, and the DEA. Uh, or, or uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, gang task force, the GTF, and um, pulled in on a RICO act, and he got taken into prison, and he was facing life, and today he's still facing life. He's still fighting the case, went through COVID in there, so they kept, you know, putting things off or whatever, but I'm um, not going to focus too much on that. What I am going to focus on is how he changed my life, um, because I was able to email him, and I was emailing him letters, and, uh, you know, I'm telling him, hey, man, you know, I uh, can't believe this happened. You know, you've been changing lives, you know, trying to help people. You know, you, you, all you've done is just, you know, help people stay out of gangs, help people change their lives. I can't believe this is happening to you. Now you're facing a life sentence for just trying to help people change their lives, brother. I feel so bad. And he would write me back physical letters because he can't use a computer. Um, they would take my emails. They would print them out. They would give them to him. And then he has to write back. And he wrote me back every time. And every time he wrote me back, he's like, yeah, 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 Kelly, stop tripping on my life sentence, homeboy. He goes, you live this outlaw lifestyle. He goes, I've been involved in this for over four decades. You expect certain things to happen. What I don't expect to happen is to be trying to help my best friend on the outside from his own life sentence. What about your life sentence, brother? And we would talk back and forth about that. And we were, I, you know, I'm not sure what you're getting at. And he would write me back. He'd say, look, Kelly. He goes, I want you to change your life. 
He goes, I gave my life to recovery. I gave my life to God. He goes, so don't worry about who I am, what I'm in or whatever. Just realize that I'm a different man now and these bars are not going to stop me from the mission that God gave me. And you're one of those missions, bro. I want you to get over yourself. And it convicted me to a point to where I realized I needed to get sober, but I needed to do it the way they were telling me to do it for a long time. I need to get into the program, fine. So after 38 years, I, I uh, decided to go into the program, and I called one of my homeboys who was from the motorcycle clubs down in San Diego, and I said, hey, I want to get in the program. I don't know nothing about this shit, but you know, what, what do I do? And he said, well, you should go to AA. And I said, well, I'm not really a an alcoholic and more of a drug addict he goes kelly listen to what i'm saying you do drugs alcoholically eventually that's going to make sense to you so go to aa with your drug problem and see what happens so he started sponsoring me god started to immediately change my life and uh and i moved from there within about two months of getting sober back to las vegas got into recovery out here stayed with it um got a sponsor and I learned a lot about myself. And then when I turn around and reflect at my brother who's, who's, you know, inside, you know, facing that situation he's facing, he did not give up. He, did, he didn't give up. And that's such a humbling thing for me. You know what I mean? Because we grew up gangsters, man. You knew us 20 years ago. We were animals. You know, we were vicious, mean, freaking people. You know, we did bad shit. And... and to see how he cared so much that I don't live that way anymore. He was the one that taught me that it's okay to be a hardcore man, but you can be a good man too. There ain't nothing wrong with that. It doesn't take any weakness. All it does is take it, it, it enforces strength inside of you if you're willing to give yourself up. So when I came into the program, I, you know, started going through these steps and quickly realized the first three steps were about my spiritual condition. And when I started to think about it, I'm thinking, okay, it's not hard for me to give my life over to God. I had a relationship with him before, but I'm meeting people in the program that are having problems with this. And it dawned on me that they're talking about a higher power. They're not talking about any specific God. There has to be a reason for this. And when I really, really studied it, went through the big book, and then went back through it again, I've, I've read all the way through the big book about half a dozen times now in the last year, studying it line for line. And then now the history books, um, and uh, I, I'm now I'm reading um, AA Comes of Age for the second time. And just reading about the stories of how they're doing, their whole concept of the higher power is not to turn you into a religious zealot. It's not to, uh, to, to make you a priest or a nun or whatever. That's not the point. The point is, is to get you out of your own head, to make you realize that there has to be a higher power outside of you that has control of your spirituality. Because yep, if, you can't, yeah. if, if you can't admit that, then you're the highest power that you have. And this is a spiritual disease that we have. And what do I mean by a spiritual disease? When I explain to people, if I'm talking too much, you can shut no, me up. No, you're good, man. Keep going. I like it. When, when I talk to people about the spiritual disease, you know, a lot of times I'll get some of my sponsees are kind of like, I don't want to talk about spiritualism. And I say, well, what's the problem with spiritualism, bro? You have a problem with believing in a higher power of God. Sometimes I hear people tell me, well, yeah, man, you know, you can't see God, dude. You know, it's invisible. How am I supposed to believe in something you can't even see? And then I'll say something like, okay, uh, do you love your children, homeboy? I said, well, of course I love my children. Okay, well, then prove it. Let me see it. Because by your own admission, if I can't see your love that you have for your kids inside of you, I don't have any reason to believe that your love exists for anybody. And what I'm getting at is the image of God that we're all made in is my ability to love, my ability to feel joy, my ability to want to tap my foot to music, my angers, my frustrations, my seat of emotion. You know, like when you tell somebody you don't know how I feel, you're absolutely right. They don't know how you feel because your feelings are individual to each particular person and it's just as invisible as the god that i believe in so how is it so hard to believe that i feel him the same way that i feel the love i have for my kids who is anybody to say you don't so that's the spiritualism and and it's those god-given 
instincts that were born with that I realized were off balance in me. My natural God-given instinct of self-respect got so stepped on by people who were hurt by somebody else because hurt people hurt people that they hurt me. And my self-respect became so damaged that I turned it into pride because now I demanded respect everywhere that I went. I'm a pro fighter. I'm a gangster. I'm a biker. I will freaking shoot you. You know what I mean? And I made sure I wanted everybody to know that so that I got my respect. What it really was was fear, bro, because I found out that I was wanting people to fear me rather than respect me. And I had a huge fear when I realized that because I had the fear of not being feared. And that's the worst fear of all. It was like a, did you ever see a Bronx tale? Oh yeah. Yeah. When he said, when he says, would you rather be feared than loved? You know, he goes, there's a difference. They don't love me. They fear me. None of them actually love me. They all fear me. And there's a big difference in that. Mm -hmm. And I need them to fear me or else they won't work for me because then they'll just take me up because they won't need me. Yeah. And, you know, and that's yeah. based on a true story about him growing up. You know, the guys see Colodro. Mm -hmm. Colodro, his name is Chaz Palmateri in real life. The, you know, that gangster in that movie. He, uh -huh. he wrote that based on himself growing up in that time period and befriending, you know, a gang, a mobster. And that mobster, like, took him under his wing and said, yeah, this isn't life for you. You have other things you need to do in life. This isn't for you. You know, mm -hmm. but that's based on a true story that he put out as a one man show originally. And then De Niro caught wind of it. He's like, hey, we should make that into a movie. And then, you know, that's how that became a thing, because that's why De Niro is even like the bus driver, because he directed that movie. And but that's based all on like growing up around mobsters and then rather be fear or loved and how there's a difference in that. Because and, and like you said, fear, people don't realize that, like, we were all running. You know, I ran 30 times. I lived in 30 different houses, you know, in 15 years of addiction in four different states. And the problem, like you probably had when you go to Mexico and San Diego and Vegas, your head went with you. You were going with you, so your problems were still coming with you. And then there was new drugs that you could find because guess what? We have fucking problems that we weren't dealing with. And the only thing we knew how to do was to drown. Like, I started drinking at 11. You know, so when when life happened at 12 and somebody I knew died, I drank over it. So now I have a learned behavior to drink anytime something bad happens. And then yeah. when I'm 22 and alcohol doesn't work for me anymore and it's pills, that was my solution every day for everyday problems. You yeah. know, so I totally get that because like same same as you, like, I wasn't doing the same kind of like, you know, I wasn't a tough guy. <laughs> I was a talker, you know. And I still am a talker, obviously. Um, but, you know, we did get in a lot of fights growing up. We grew up right outside of Camden, New Jersey. And so we did get into a lot of fights growing up. And, you know, it doesn't make me tougher. It makes me afraid. When you were fighting as a kid, it's because you, you were out of fear. It wasn't because you were really afraid. It wasn't because you were tough. It's because you were afraid and you were scared, yeah. you know. Yeah. And you don't know that then. You think you're tough shit back then. But looking back in retrospect, when you really do some self like self reflection on your life and why you did what you did, you realize, oh, like I was just a pussy, and I was afraid the entire time, and I needed to keep running from myself. You I know? was afraid of being looked at as who I really was inside, <laughs> you know, <laughs> or afraid to be, you know, viewed by everybody else as just a normal dude, you yeah. know, because normal, normal that that wasn't tough, that wasn't cool, you know, it wasn't punk rock. Yeah, it wasn't punk rock, you know? Yeah. And I was a geek when I grew up, so the, I, I separated myself from that personage as far as I possibly could to become the complete opposite of what I was when I was in elementary school. I didn't want to be, you know, looked at as a little dorky kid that, you know, wore tough skins. I wanted to be looked at as, you know, the badass that wore leather and spikes and chains and, you know. Did you get crazy can, punk rock hair, too, in the 80s? Did you do oh, that yeah. whole thing? Did you? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. When I ran away, yeah. Of course, when I lived on my own, I did. Yeah, of yeah. course. I, 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 you know, I had to because when I think of punk rock in the '80s, you said the leather, and I think of the hair too. You know. And... I had the painted leather jacket. I had the bondage pants and Doc Martens. I still got Doc Martens, <laughs> but, but my Doc Martens are construction boots. And it was funny because when I first got into recovery, um. You know, one of my one of my buddies, I, I work in the office now, I'm a commercial estimator, but one of my buddies 
He goes, man, he goes, uh, you just never left that whole punk rock lifestyle, huh? You brought the Doc Martens to work with you. And I said, well, that's really only so that I could feel more punk at work. <laughs> <laughs> that's hilarious. <laughs> yeah. So how was recovery life for you for the last year then? You know, a year and five, four months. So do you go, how many meetings do you hit? Do you, you know, you take people through the steps yet? Are you still going through them or? Phenomenal. Um, yeah, I, I went through my steps. I'm getting ready to start going through them again when I hit my year and a half. Um, I sponsor multiple people. I actually, um, I actually run, a, it, it's not really anything. It's just nonprofit. I, I do blogs and videos um, on outlawsobriety.com. That's me where I, you know, I, I put out one video on YouTube about three months ago and I'm just kind of taking my time with it, you know, circulating that video, but just talking about, and um, I can no, tag that in the description too. I'll, I'll put oh, yeah. the, if, um, I'll be able to find the outlaw sobriety and I'll, um, outlawsobriety.com is it? At All right. uh, I can shoot you a link of the actual video if you want. There's only one in there right now. No, um, fine. But, but I do a lot of panels. I'm involved in H and I, of course, which is hospital institutions out here. They haven't opened up the institutions yet. Um, yeah, I, I'm not sure how, how long they're going to, but um, they're starting to loosen up a little bit because the whole COVID thing. Oh wait, uh, no, I, I was thinking like when I was in AA. I believe you needed three or five years they recommended before they let you go back into the jails to talk. Oh, no, no. Um, they don't have that. I know for hospitals, I needed 90 days. They wouldn't let me go because I, I was speaking early on at meetings. My, my um, I got a 30-day chip at a meeting that I was a speaker at, that I was yeah. a featured speaker. And because, you know, I was doing stand-up comedy before I went into rehab. And so I was used to already talking in front of people. And the last two months of me doing stand-up looked like me on stage, high out of my mind, and just venting about my day. Just yeah. like I would in a meeting, except where I would go up there, like, hey, I'm JD and I'm an addict. Oh, shit, I'm at the wrong place tonight. Oh, well, we'll keep going. You know, like, because I was wrong. I was being honest. Like, I was hurting. And I was trying to, like, tell people, I'm, I'm an addict. I'm an alcoholic. And I would go on stage and say that shit, and they'd laugh. And then, you know, they think I'm joking. I mean, like, no, nah, nah, I'm venting to you guys. I'm high off my ass. I got arrested today. Like, you know what I mean? Like, and I still went up on stage that night. And it did. that was me, like, getting it out. So when I got sober, I was like, I got to get used to talking sober now. You know, like, I got to get used to, like, being in front of people sober. So I used to, like, you know, share a lot. And then finally someone's like, hey, like, you, you seem to have a lot of things to say. Like, you want to speak at my meeting? And I'm like, sure, why not? You know, like 30 days. Like, why not talk in the media about all my recovery? Like, what the fuck was I thinking? <laughs> <laughs> and, but still, like, it felt great, you know? And I got to get people that were sitting there, like, a chance to see that it's not getting any better out there, you know? And I got to get some hope that, you know, whatever. But, yeah, so that, and I think I did my first H&I, and it was at my 90 days is when they finally let me, and I went into a hospital, and we talked to them, and I started doing them. So that's why I knew, at least in Southern California, I think it was three or five years that you had to have before they let you go into the jails to speak. Um, yeah, everyone, that, that, that would make sense. I know that um, when I came out here to, to Vegas and I was moving along in my recovery, um, I went to an H&I meeting and there was only about five people because COVID really took a huge effect on our people were doing Zoom meetings. A lot of people had relapsed and, and uh, you know, so... So stuff like that was happening, and um, and so I got into uh, the H and I when it was you know kind of hurting at that point, and now it's it's starting to grow a lot more. But I I started doing panels you know right away, and and I do um, I, I'm a panel coordinator for a place out here um, where it's uh, um, kind of like a uh, well it's it's a, a halfway house I guess for people just coming out of prison at a lockup and they dedicate they dedicate themselves to the AA program and uh so I go uh I'm the panel coordinator for that on Sundays um and then I get invited a lot to go to other panels and stuff like that throughout Las Vegas and uh, and I do a lot of speaking engagements and things like that that's awesome so you're you're doing it right you're throwing yourself you're putting as much work into your recovery as you were into your addiction that's what keeps me sober today yeah, me too. Like this, yeah. this, like doing this podcast with you just keeps me so over today. And then yeah, even like, when you put it on, you know, YouTube or however you do it, you know, 
if I know that other people are watching it, if I just see that somebody else has watched it, that'll keep me sober, you know, yeah. and that's because I know that I'm helping somebody else. You're helping somebody else. So you helped me today stay sober. I appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> and I, I, and that's, you know, as well as I know from the program that a and meeting is two alcoholics having a conversation, you yeah. know, and whether it's through Skype or in person, it's still, we're having a conversation that's real and raw and it's truth. We're talking about our fuck ups. We're talking about our victories. And, yeah. and giving some hope and also letting people know that, you know, you're not the only one that did some crazy fucked up shit, you know, like, and that's okay. We can live and learn from that. It doesn't matter if, you know, I just talked to somebody who got sober in their thirties and did a lot of wrongs and, you know, gets to use those life lessons now moving forward. And it doesn't matter if you're in your fifties and that's when you're pushing those life lessons out because there's people in their thirties that need to hear it and be like, oh shit, that's how I am now. And I can get out of this. There yeah. is a way out of this, you know, yeah. and that's that's why it was so important to me to do 30 and 30 during recovery month. And just, you know, even if it, you know, just try to get as many stories out there as possible right now, because people are not good. Ninety three thousand overdoses last year. That is not oh, a yeah. good number, man. Like yeah. 70 alone were from fentanyl. Like, yeah. you know, that's that's so like beyond crazy to me, you know, because like 15 years ago, 10 years ago. There was like 10, 20 overdoses, 10, 20,000 overdoses a year. And they were like mostly all accidental. It wasn't really fentanyl. And dude, it was like, you know, he did too much of a bag. He just got out of jail and he did an old, he did as much as he used to do when he overdosed, you know, or he relapsed and he did a big bag like he used to when he overdosed. But it yeah. wasn't that one, you know, like you said, how like they're pressing them. That's been scaring the shit out of me, you know, like I could relapse and fucking die right away just by doing 130. You know, I used to, yeah. to do six thirties in one shot and one big line, boom, six thirties up my nose. Yeah. And a matter of a second, now one of those thirties could be laced and I'd be dead. Dead. It happened to me in Ensenada. So yeah, yeah, what did happen with that? Yeah, you mentioned briefly. Um about three years ago, kind of in in the height of my addiction, I was smoking a lot of meth and doing a whole lot of pills. And uh and I owned a company and I uh, bought a um a cruise. For my wife so we went on a five-day cruise from Long Beach into Ensenada um, and uh, I was living in San Diego at the time and um, we went down to Ensenada and uh, and and <laughs> we were walking around the town and we saw this uh, pharmacy so I thought I want to see if they got any 30s I've already got 30s on me in the boat you know yeah but I thought, I'm, I'm going to go grab another handful. So I went into this pharmacy, and um, they uh, they said, yeah, we got 30s. And they brought out two bottles, and they laid eight of the light blue Nortons in front of me. And then they laid two bright blue Vectors in front of me. And I said, Vector stopped making those. Those aren't real. Those don't even look right. And I knew it. The color was wrong. I, you know, because, the, yeah, the and they stopped making those like in 2006 or something because there was a big bust. And so I'm like, those, those aren't really, but those are super old or they're counterfeit as fuck. And he's like, no, oh, no, no, they're, they're, they're real. They're good. They're, and I'm like, all right, whatever. So against my better judgment, I bought them anyway. So I bought all 10. I bought the eight real ones and then the two fake ones and i knew they were fake but to prove that they were fake my dumb addicted ass i went into a filthy bathroom right down in in the alley there from the pharmacy and it was just like seriously a little it's it just a commode you open the door tiny little room little bitty sink you know toilet and that was it so i put the toilet seat down i sat on it backwards and i crushed up that one of those you know bright blue pills and I snorted it and I put the other bright blue one down. I was getting ready to crush that. And I didn't want to do them both at the same time because I'm thinking to myself, well, what if this isn't real? You know, what if it's fentanyl? So I did it anyway to find out. So I did that when I took the other pill out to put it on the toilet and I fell backwards off the toilet seat and I hit my head on the door and I'm laying on the floor and I'm going, uh, that wasn't a good idea. And so it took me all of about, 10 minutes to pick myself up off the floor because I was, I felt my life leaving. And uh, 
I grabbed that other pill and I put it in my pocket and I came out of the door and I'm trying to compose myself because I didn't want to freak out my wife, but she knew. She's like, what's wrong with you? And I said, I think I just made a bad mistake, man. And she goes, oh, no. What? She goes, what was it, fentanyl? And the reason I, I, I say that is because my, my best friend in the entire world just died about a year and a half before this happened from a fentanyl overdose one day before I was supposed to take him to rehab and uh and that really kicked a big hole in me and um for the next uh you know two years after his death i i became very 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 homicidally suicidal and uh and so anyway i did that pill and i told her i said i i'm i don't know how to tell you this i'm just gonna tell you i'm I'm dying right now i feel myself going i can't walk anymore so i had to sit down on this filthy ass sidewalk in Ensenada, this little kid comes up and he was saying, chickly, chickly. And I, and I just, all I could do is shake my head and he gave me a flower and I couldn't reach up and take it. So he put it on my lap and I'm looking at this flower and I just kind of set my head back. And I remember this whole spiritual experience happening to me. I could see myself coming out like of my face it was weird as shit. I saw myself coming out of my face, like hovering kind of like this, coming out. And then I started to turn, so my body started to face the sky, and I'm looking at myself horizontally. You know, my head up here, and I'm looking up at the sky, and I could hear voices. I could hear Greg's voice, my homeboy that died, and he was telling me, don't go this way, you don't have to do this. What I didn't know about fentanyl at the time was it doesn't last very long. And I really thought that in the next couple moments I was going to die. But what started to happen was it very quickly, within a minute, started to wear off. And when it started to wear off, I started thinking, I I can feel myself coming back and everything just kind of disappeared and dissipated in front of me. And after about a minute of that, I stood up and my wife goes, are you okay? You were talking to yourself, you were saying weird shit. I'm like, go back to the boat, man. I went back to the boat, and um, I, I got lucky. If I would have done that second pill, I wouldn't be here today. I agree. Yeah, and, and also, let's be real, your tolerance to, like, just opiates in general. Mm-hmm. Like, that mixture of already having a high tolerance of, you know, a couple hundred, a few hundred, you know, milligrams a day easy, you know, if not more, like you said, you know, yeah. that's also going to help you with, even though fentanyl is so much powerful, but still that little bit can also help too by having that high of a tolerance. I mean, for that long, you've been doing drugs, all yeah. that came into play, I'm sure. Um, but mm-hmm. either way, the moral of the story is you didn't do the second one and yeah. you're sitting here talking to me right now. I, I would hope that you just dropped it on the ground and crushed it or flushed it or did something with it so that you definitely no. didn't. What'd no. you do? What'd you I do? I went back to the boat and about uh, the last day that we were on the boat, I wanted to see if that really was fentanyl so i cut it into four pieces and i did a quarter of it and i realized yeah that was fentanyl and then i threw it away <laughs> i had to make sure yeah, you know, I'm a fucking <laughs> yeah my body leaving me wasn't enough proof i just need a little bit more oh i was so is. stupid i'm like i'm wondering if the identical pill is if that was laced too you know? yeah you know, and I, I always say, and that gives, that that comes back to, like, I always say, to like, a lot of us, we weren't addicted to a certain thing. We were addicted to more, you know, when we were addicted to, like, whatever it was in front of us. And then once it was in front of us, we wanted more of it. And it didn't matter if it was jujitsu. It didn't matter if it was something positive or it was something negative. Our mind only knew more of it to fill in voids that we were trying to escape. You know that... Um, that song, uh, that dumb band, um, Guns N' Roses, right? I used to do a little, but a little wouldn't do it, so a little got more and more. And that's, uh, that's really profound when you think about it in in the sense of a heroin addict, because that's exactly what it was for pills. You know, when I, when I get, you know, when I first did pills, you know, would only take, you know, those three pills. No, but from the, I never did just one pill from the very first time I started. I did three that day. The next day I did three. The next day I did three. I think it was the day after that I did six. 
And because I remember the first prescription that I had, I ran out of them about eight days early. And I called my doctor and I said, I don't think those pills are good enough. Because okay, we'll kick you up to 30. I'll go ahead and write your prescription and give you a note to have it filled early. And what I didn't realize at the time was why, why my doctor was, you know, being so cool about giving me these pills. You know, I even told him at one point I'm addicted to it. And he told me, well, I'm not taking them. So it's not really my problem. Yeah, it's good. That was his answer because he was getting money out of it. He was one of the doctors in, I think it was like 2011 or something like that, where they did a big sweep of these doctors. That's when I started switching over to heroin because mm-hmm. um, it was really hard to get pills anymore in Vegas. I, I remember doing heroin all the time. Yeah. And, and a lot of doctors got busted. You know, mine, and, uh, mine did in 2013. And he was a shady doctor, only took cash. You know, when you're in the waiting room, you're in the waiting room with 20 other people that they're going to see that hour. You yeah. Know, that kind of thing. Yeah. So, no, I, I totally, I know what you mean. They didn't give a shit, dude. They're like, what do you want? I'm like, what do I want? You know, you know you doctors shouldn't ask me what I want. I'm an addict. I was like, um, I need 120 oxycodone and 30 milligram and 120 one mil- or two milligram Xanax. They're like, uh, two, here you go. I'm like, uh, see you next month in 28 days. Yeah, uh, okay. that'll be $300. <laughs> yep. <laughs> see you later. And, yeah. you know, that yeah, the first visit was 350 and what's funny is I, you, you, you know it's a shady doctor when you need a referral from another patient. You, you know, it's not like you needed a referral from another doctor. <laughs> the referral had to be like, you know, yeah, man, he's cool. He's not going to rat you out kind of yeah. referral. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, and you're going into a shady house to do these doctors. Like, I got a phone call from the receptionist when they got shut up, when they got shut down saying, Hey, they just got arrested, but your script is sitting on my desk if you want to come in and grab your last script because it's going to be your last one. I was like, I'll be there in 10. So I shot down and walked in. She handed it to me, and I left, and I got it filled, and I didn't go back ever again. But, yeah, yeah, man, I I know how those doctors were. They they didn't give a shit. They were just writing them off and just, yep, here you go. Yep, here you go. Here's more. You need more. Here you go. And it didn't matter. And then all those pharmacies started talking to each other, and it made it a lot harder for those doctors to do that kind of thing because you couldn't doctor shop anymore because the pharmacies were overriding the doctor uh doctor prescriptions after a while i uh i i walked into um that addiction of pills um without a clue of what pills were and after six years i had a doctorate of every pill you could think of, all the different makers and manufacturers. Yep. I had a list of all the doctors in Vegas that you could go give cash to. I had a list from our union hall of whoever was using their insurance um, to get prescriptions filled. And we would go, you know, a couple me and a couple of my friends, we'd go, you know, muscle those guys for their pills, you know, and tell them shit like, hey, you know, we're, we know that you're getting, uh, you know, probably 240 pills filled every month and it's going to cost you about 20 of those pills every Friday to stay on this job. And, you know, they'd be like, well, what if I refuse? They'd say, well, we'll be at your house and take you to the desert and have a discussion about it by 6 o'clock. And they believed us. <laughs> you know, Why so wouldn't they believe you, though? <laughs> because we were serious about it. <laughs> you know, we had a pretty cool little, uh, I, I say cool, but we had a we had a real unique little setup going where there was four of us uh, that were doing pills at the time in the union and one of us would get our prescription filled on the first week the other the second week the other the third week and the other the fourth week fourth week of the month and we would front each other you know pills from our prescription so we never ran out that's like me and, and, my uh, friends, yep. and, and i was selling so many pills in the union at that time in las vegas that i actually financed my one of my first Harley Davidsons with that when I was when I started the motorcycle clubs. Um, <laughs> paid oh, for I, my can first I can believe it. I, I you know if, if I if I actually didn't do so many, I would have been able to buy a house, no problem. You know what I mean? Right. But then again, you know I was strictly selling them for to be able to do as many for free as possible that day and to buy cigarettes once a day. You know, you know what I'll I mean? Tell you, though, it 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 will. Uh, it's a false sense of security, JD, because when I moved back to San Diego, um, you know, when I first met my wife now, um, she was uh, making about a half a million dollars a year. I didn't have to work if I didn't want to. And sometimes I didn't. Uh, when we moved to San Diego, uh, we started the company doing exactly what she was doing. And we made that money on our own. 
Um, we made a whole lot of money. I started another company, a glazing company. And uh, about three years into this uh, is when we started really getting heavy with drugs and I got her into it. And uh, within the time of a year or even less than a year, we lost both companies. We lost our home. We had to go move into a friend's apartment and we were addicted. And, uh, and right now, uh, my wife has been in recovery too. Uh, she just got a year um, last month. And, uh, and just now, you know, things are starting to turn back to where we used to be. You know, I mean, we're not, you know, making that kind of money anymore, but we're sustained. God's taking care of us. We're both working. Um, this last week's been kind of hard, though, because uh, she got sick, um, and we thought it was COVID. So I've been working remotely from home for the last week, but uh, she, she turned up negative, but she was super sick anyway. It was weird. So I didn't catch anything, though. So... Um, you know, it's like you, it's like the country song, you know, you play it backwards, you get everything back. But it, it really is like that, you know what I mean? Um, the other thing, and, you know, my friend who's who's uh, locked up right now, who was the inspiration of my recovery, um, he, he told me, he said, always keep this in mind, Kelly, that um, every morning that you wake up after you did a binge, you're always going to look through your phone to see who you texted, who you threatened, what you said to who. Um, you're always going to be regretting, you know, situations that you had. He said, in recovery, we don't have those problems, bro. He goes, in recovery, the only problem that we ever have is what are we going to do with a good day tomorrow? And he said, if you want that kind of problem, you want what we had, we want to go to any length to get it, bro, get over yourself and get the program. Yeah. And, uh, and, and, yep. and like you, you said, know, you, ha you have to work just as hard at this. And if you don't work just as hard at this as you did, as you, because like getting high wasn't easy for everybody, you know, yeah. waking up, finding money, finding a dealer who was good, actually getting them to meet you, you know, and then getting high and then doing it all over again. They weren't sometimes most of the time, easy tasks. A lot of no. the times they were exhausting mentally and physically. You know, I was driving two hours to get high, you know, my no. last three years, four times a week sitting in mcdonald's parking lots for hours and hours and hours waiting to meet my dude and you know it was exhausting and i don't have to spend my days doing that anymore i can spend my days doing five interviews in a day you know yeah. i can helping somebody talking to somebody just relating to somebody you know we couldn't be any more different but we're exactly the same you know yeah and that's the yeah. beautiful thing about recovery is when you want to relate to somebody you're going to when yeah. you don't want it it's gonna be like oh that's not me he wears a red hat i wear a blue hat that, that's definitely not me you yeah. know and it's one of those things that you know when i got sober i started driving an hour to meetings i found a meeting about an hour away and twice a week i would drive to it just to go just because i was driving so far to get high i wanted to drive far to be sober yeah so i did that for a while and i that was one of the best things i could have did for myself because it gave me time to like reflect on the meetings and what we talked about yeah so you know you have to want this and you have to work very hard at it because it's not an easy thing but it is a something that is so worth it that i can't even describe sometimes how worth the worth it the feeling is to wake up and not be in pain you know you know i'll, I'll tell i i and like for anybody who's listening you know if, if they're you know new in the program um the easiest thing the easiest thing that you're going to do a detox and, and come off drugs that's the easy part the hardest part is being left with who you are but it's who you are that caused you to be an addict in the first place and that needs to come out need yeah. to, we, we really need to be willing to get over ourselves and and once you start taking those steps they become easier it becomes more relieving every day you wake up in recovery you, you want to wake up, you want to go to a meeting, you want to help somebody else. The further along you go, the more exciting it becomes because learning these things about myself after 38 years of trying to find an answer on my own, multiple times trying to get sober and always relapsing. When I got into this program and I finally did what my homeboy kept telling me to do for years, um, it was a real relieving, rewarding experience, man. Because even though 
I had to face some things about myself that I really didn't want to. It was the best thing that I could ever do. I always, you know, tell people that, like, when it comes to, like, your fourth step, your resentments and things like that. I remember my first sponsor told me, write down your resentments, and I started writing them down. And, and in my head, I'm like, okay, it's, you know, let's get these people shit out on the table. <laughs> you know, these are the fools that all deserve a fist up inside their head, you know. And I bring in the list. He goes, oh, you're not done with that. And I said, no, 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 I'm done. These are all the assholes in my life. I said, no, 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 you're not done with that, man. we got to find out your problem. And I went, what do you mean my problem? <laughs> That's a fine print for you, you know? That's where step 10 works for us every single day. Okay. Spot checking ourselves. <laughs> yep. Yeah, I mean, it's so important. And I, I love the steps. And, yeah, we don't, like – preach the steps at our meeting center because it's mental health but i think anybody can benefit from the steps you you take whether you know, you're an alcoholic or not absolutely you take Everybody alcoholic out, out over yourselves yeah whatever makes your life unmanageable you take that and you put it and replace alcohol in the steps with that word and whatever makes your life unmanageable you do the steps on that and you will be relieved of that whatever that obsession is you will be relieved by the time you're done if you do it honestly mm -hmm. You know, and like anything else in this program, if you're doing it honest, it's going to work. If you work hard at it, it's going to work. Yeah, we're, we're always going to be addicts. You know, we may be like the big book says in in uh, in the forward. I think it's to the first edition that, that we're more than a hundred men and women who have recovered. But read what comes after that. We've recovered mind and body, right? But later on, I think it's in chapter nine, it talks about how spiritually we are never recovered. We will always be in recovery. Yeah. So if I ever have a relapse, it's not the pill that caused me to relapse. It's not the alcohol that caused me to relapse. I had a spiritual relapse first. Yeah. And then I just ended up with a side effect. And you said you have some pro you had people like that have issues with spirituality. Yeah. Um, one of my favorite, I've had that, you know, and I had that myself. I grew up going to Catholic church and all that. And I didn't want to do God. Like, honestly, Bill Mary behind me, he's my higher power. That's why I got that behind me. And, um, you know, the thing is though, somebody said to me once, like, this is a spiritual program, not a religious program. And I was like, what, you know, and I'm new. I'm like, what the fuck's the difference? You know, like, come on. And they were like, well, spirituality is for people who have been to hell and religion is for people who fear hell. And I was like, oh, shit, that makes a lot of sense to me. That clicked, you know, because that did. I've been to hell. I know what that's like. Yeah. I get that. So that's something that at least if ever, ever brought up, that's always helped me, who was against the whole God thing, um, was spirituality is for people who have been to hell and religion is for people who fear it. And it makes total sense because I do see the people that are all faith-based. It's like, oh, I'm God-fearing and I'm, you know, this fearing. And I'm like... I don't want to have the. I want to walk into those fears. You know, fear is something they have to face because that's life. Yeah. And when you get through it, you get stronger. And next time you have fear, you have confidence. And it gets easier to get through life that way on your own merits and without any substances because you're going through it each time. You're getting yeah. stronger and stronger in your mind. You're not physically strong. You don't got the big muscles, but they're not showing, but they are up here. And you will feel them every time you get through something easier and easier but you have to start by going through it the first time and then walk through that fear again because it's not done you're going to have fear the rest of your life and if you don't have fear in your life then you're not living it right because you're supposed to yeah so right. and i'd love talking to you like i said we had a great time and i appreciate it and i'll hit you up when it's coming out great i appreciate right. it thanks, thanks have a good weekend buddy have a good All weekend right. bye, bye, -bye.